gentlemen, and welcome to the second part of my series on objectivity and subjectivity in ethics. Okay, so moving on. Now I'm going to start down the, the road of, to a clearer set of distinctions by looking at how we use terms like objective and relative. I will also look at some distinctions closely related to these. For example, the objective slash subjective distinction when discussing morality is often associated with a fact slash value distinction. I will show that some of the ways we use these terms raise some serious but not too often ignored questions. These questions will suggest that we switch to a clearer set of terms and distinctions. A. Values are facts. It is widely assumed that something can either present a fact, example, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, or a non-face value, example, that is a very good story. Facts are said to be objective, while values are subjective. Nothing can be both a fact and a value, and nothing can be both objective and subjective, or so it is thought. This looks good on the surface, until you start to ask some questions about what this really means. For example, even though people speak of values as referring to some type of subjective non-fact entity, those same values are said to be able to influence things in the real world. They cause us to behave one way or another, or to choose one thing over another. These non-fact values somehow cause the world to be different than it would have otherwise been. How can a non-fact entity influence the flow of matter through the physical universe? As I sit here typing this uh, paper, the carbon compounds in my finger press against the heat, sending electronic signals into the computer. It is not unreasonable to assume that we can trace the causes of these finger twitches back to the events going on in my brain. My brain, brain has the structure that it does because of some interaction between some DNA molecules and their environment. Thus, it makes sense to say that in addition, I mean in addition to these facts, the causes of my typing these words are also depending on some separate and distinct non-fact entity called a value. A reasonable first guess seems to be that the term value simply refers to a subset of the facts that cause me to be typing this essay. In other words, if values refer to something that plays a causal role, then they have to be referring to something in the physical world. They have to be referring to something factual. We simply need to determine which facts they are. Any talk of non-fact values ultimately should be treated with the same level of suspicion as talks about immaterial souls or ghosts, as an extraordinary claim requiring extraordinary proof. B. Individual differences. Values are facts. However, different people value different things. I value writing philosophical papers on the nature of value. Very few people that I know value spending their free time on this type of activity. Subjectivists often assert that the claim that values are objective means that everybody must like or dislike the same things. The claim that values are objective somehow requires that everybody must like or dislike liver and onions equally. The subjectivist then gladly points out that people have different preferences as proofs that values are not, in fact, objective. However, height is objective, yet this is not said to require that everybody be the same height. Location is objective, even though we take it to be a basic assumption that no two people can occupy exactly the same space at the same time. We differ in our ages, our weight, our eye color, how much hair we have, who our parents are, the precise sequence of our genetic codes, and yet in none of these cases do we take these facts as proof against the objective nature of these properties. Nowhere else do we take proof of individual differences as proof that we are dealing with non-fact entities. C. Aggregates. In a world of individual differences, we also have aggregates, propositions that are true of groups that neither I mean, there are true of groups that need not be true of any individual within the group. We can talk about the average height of the human male, the center of population in the state of Michigan, the total weight of the people who play for the Denver Broncos, among a number of other things. These aggregates have two characteristics that are relevant to the discussion. First, the aggregates depend very much on the traits of the individuals that make up the group. As those individual traits change, the aggregate will also change. As people move about the state of Michigan, the center of population shifts, and the average height of the human male seems to be increasing over time. Second, depending on the size of the group, the truth of the aggregate is substantially independent of what is true of any given member of the group. I can fly from Hawaii to Augusta, Maine, and the center of population for the United States will make only the most imperceptible of changes. When I die, the average height of a human male will change only slightly. Why are these aspects of aggregates important? 
They are important because we can aggregate values just as we aggregate location, height, and weight. When we talk about these value aggregates, we are talking about real-world entities that very much depend on what it is true individuals that make up the aggregate. Yet, depending on the size of the group, the truth is also substantially independent of what is true of any particular member of the group. Clearly, there are some things that cannot be aggregated. What is the total eye color of the people living in Mobile, Alabama? How do you aggregate eye color? This is a nonsense question, a question that has no answer. Perhaps value is like this. What, for example, is the average of my fondness for chocolate ice cream and my wife's preference for kiwi thyme? I mean, kiwi lime. Is the average perhaps butterscotch pineapple? The fact is, we aggregate desires all the time. A group of people at work want to go to lunch together and are trying to decide on a restaurant. To make that decision, they look for the restaurant that will best fulfill an aggregate of all of their desires. They weigh each individual's preferences, including ice cream preferences, as well as their budget, and say this restaurant will best fulfill that aggregate of desires. There is no average between my desire for chocolate ice cream and my, uh, and any other. However, we can recognize that a pint of chocolate ice cream and a pint of kiwi lime is better than a quart of chocolate or a quart of kiwi lime relative to this particular desire aggregate. The person who says that we cannot aggregate desires would have to conclude that a benevolent person given a choice between two options, A, a nuclear weapon goes off in New York City, or B, a person in L.A. suffers a scratch on his hand, can't do nothing but cry, I don't know what to do. The claim that we cannot aggregate desires not only flies in the face of everyday experience, it is easy to reduce to absurdity. Within the scope of this paper, I do not have room to defend the claim that moral concepts are desire aggregates. Ultimately, I believe that moral statements are best interpreted as statements that evaluate desires according to their tendency to fulfill or thwart other desires. In other words, morality is ultimately concerned with what, is, what it is good for us to like, with us being a key concept. If this is true, then moral questions, example, should we ban capital punishment and are homosexual acts immoral, are very similar to questions like, which restaurant should we go to? There are only two key differences. One, moral questions ultimately evaluate desires rather than restaurants. And two, they evaluate desires relative, I mean, they evaluate desires relative to an aggregate of all desires, not just the desires of those people who are going to lunch together. So the question of should we ban capital punishment becomes if everybody hated capital punishment, should we or would we be better off? Of course, we need to add provisions for such things as ought implies can and similar restrictions. There is no sense to be made of prescribing options that are not possible. For example, so we look only at possible options. For the purpose of this, it does not matter whether I can defend this the, whose uh, thesis of moral value. The important points uh, to draw out of this uh, part of the discussion are 1. Desire aggregate claims describe something that exists in the real world. They are objectively true or false. 2. Claims about desire aggregates are substantially independent of the desires of any given person, just as there is one and only one total mass for all of the people on Earth. Hope you liked this second episode. See you in the next one and keep your bullets out of your gun. Give me love, fire.